And hello, it's Dr. Debbie Morris, and today we're going to have some fun by taking, um, we'll, we'll add a little bit more information, but we're going to take the information that we learned in these last two lectures and apply it in clinical situations so that you can see how physiology correlates with pathophysiology and with disease processes um, and we should have some fun with this. So my objective is just to use the information that you've learned about cardiovascular physiology to help you understand clinical scenarios. Briefly before we give you a clinical scenario I want to talk about some anatomy. So the heart muscle is supplied by arteries that are called coronary arteries. They originate from the very base of the aorta. So just distal to the aortic valve are the um, ostia, the openings to the coronary arteries. And there is a left system and a right system. The left system consists of what's called the left main coronary artery, which then branches into a left anterior descending and a circumflex coronary artery. Um, and then the right coronary artery simply continues to become the distal right coronary artery. The left system supplies the septum, the papillary muscles, that stabilize the mitral valve and then the the heart muscle of the left atrium and the left ventricle and it it is often disease in the left system that causes the problems that we see in the emergency department although you can also have plaque in the right system when atherosclerosis or plaques of cholesterol and fibroblasts build up within the um, lumen of the coronary arteries, it can limit blood flow. Sometimes this happens very slowly, um, slowly restricting blood flow to areas of the um, cardiac myocardium um, and when it happens very slowly you can get growth of branches that bypass the obstruction that's called collateral circulation and in general every area of the myocardium is supplied by a single branch of the coronary arterial system Here I just added an image of the um, process of collateral circulation. So again, if you have a narrowing in a coronary artery from plaque that is growing very slowly, over time you can get additional vessels that join back up providing um, circulation proximal to the blockage. Eventually, if you have a plaque, which we would call a fixed obstruction, and you increase arterial uh, or oxygen demand, and you remember that oxygen demand is um, determined or oxygen use, oxygen delivery is determined by lower uh, local factors. But if you're doing something like exercising that increases oxygen demand to the part of the coronary artery supplied by this partially blocked artery and you can't get enough blood by, you get ischemia during those periods of higher demand and that ischemia results in chest pain that we call angina pectoris, which just means chest pain. But angina pectoris is understood to be chest pain from cardiac ischemia. And angina is often reversible if you 
um, decreased demand again, the pain will go away. Sometimes that plaque, which is covered with endothelium, ruptures. The endothelium itself is disturbed. And when that happens, um, chemicals or substances are released from the endothelial cells that attract um, platelets and start the cascade that results in a blood clot. So a blood clot can form now further uh, blocking blood flow through this artery. In fact, potentially completely blocking blood flow through this artery and resulting in ischemia and potentially cell death uh, distal to the blockage. Sorry. Sometimes, and this is a little bit controversial, but sometimes coronary artery smooth muscle has spasms that cause a constriction that results in ischemia in the muscle distal to the um, constriction. And that is called Prince Metal or Variant Angina. So it is chest pain, it is caused by ischemia, but it is thought to be caused by spasms in the smooth muscle of the coronary artery as opposed to plaque. Because when these people are, are um, images are taken, angiograms, um, during cardiac catheterization, dye can be injected here. Let's go back directly into the osteum, allowing us to take um, pictures of blood flow in the coronary arteries. These people don't have obvious blockages that can be seen um, unless they are currently experiencing spasm. Now, we treat angina with a drug called nitroglycerin that you've all heard of. And what nitroglycerin does is cause the release of nitric oxide. The other name for nitric oxide is endothelium derived relaxing factor. And it causes vasodilation um, in arterial vessels and in venous vessels. And if we are talking about um, angina pectoris without a rupture and a clot, that vasodilation may relieve uh, pain. Um, if we're talking about a rupture and a clot, but there's some collateral circulation, it may also uh, relieve pain. One of the things that's important to know about the pharmacology of nitroglycerin is that if you're using it continuously, you develop something called tachyphylaxis or tolerance and it quits working very well. Um, and for this reason, people with angina pectoris who take long acting um, nitroglycerin like medicines, for instance, nitro paste, take it only for part of the day and need time in every 24 hour cycle to allow uh, the tolerance to resolve so it will continue to work. So often these folks will use the nitro paste during the day and not at night because oxygen demand tends to be higher during the day when they're active. So let's move on to a case and some clinical correlation. We have a patient who's 52 years old, a man. He's diabetic, he's a smoker, he has a long history of poorly controlled hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. And he comes into the emergency department via ambulance complaining of crushing substernal chest pressure. He says it's seven to eight out of 10 and it radiates to his left shoulder and his left jaw. So my first question is what are Mr. Jones risk factors and I guess Mr. Jones's risk factors for coronary artery disease. And why are they risk factors? And we'll come back to that in a second. 
and my second is what's causing the pain. So I want you to think about risk factors while I talk about what's causing the pain. My guess is that Mr. Jones has ischemia in some part of his cardiac myocardium of his muscle of his heart muscle and that that ischemia is resulting in pain signals that are being sent um, and resulting in this crushing chest pressure. Um, cardiac pain is often described not as pain but as pressure. People will say it doesn't hurt it feels like there's an elephant sitting on my chest. So some people will call it pain but sometimes if you ask somebody to for instance put their pain give their pain a number give you know give them a pain scale give me a number from one to ten they'll say well it's not pain it's pressure so don't argue with them about whether it's pain or not um, but understand that that sensation is not always described as pain so let's talk about risk factors we have a lot of research um, and much of it from what what is called the Framingham Ham Heart Study on the risk factors for coronary artery disease and they are divided into risk factors that can be changed they're modifiable and risk factors that can't be changed which are non modifiable so our patient has a couple of clear non modifiable risk factors he's over 50 and he's a man we haven't yet asked him about a family history of coronary heart disease. He may have that as well, but we don't know. And he has a number of modifiable risk factors. He has uh, diabetes, he has hyperlipidemia, he has hypertension, and he is a smoker. In addition to this, he's been non-compliant I wouldn't be surprised if he was overweight physically inactive and had a diet um, that was not optimal for coronary artery disease so we slap on some electrodes and do a 12 lead EKG and we see some abnormalities now just you, you don't have to interpret this EKG but do you see an obvious abnormality? I see an obvious abnormality. I see, among other things, that in leads two and three, he has um, a ST segment that is not isoelectric. And I see that in his chest leads, especially in leads V1 and V2, which are um, septal leads he has again kind of an ST segment that's very elevated with a very big T wave so there's something funky going on with ventricular repolarization and these are the findings that I talked to you of ventricular ischemia that we call tombstones so this guy's having a big anterior um, anterior and ventricular uh, ischemic episode myocardial infarction and this is what we would call a STEMI an ST elevation myocardial infarction why are there abnormalities there are abnormalities because the big part of his heart muscle that is not getting oxygen correctly is not is also not functioning correctly it's not depolarizing and repolarizing in a normal cycle and we have abnormal currents um, that we are detecting through the EKG so one of the things that happens when we're monitoring somebody either in the um, emergency room or in the ICU or in a step down unit um, the it, we do a we have a constant um, lead to available um, that we could see on a monitor or print out on paper and when we print it out on paper we call it a rhythm strip so we notice that something funky is happening with Mr. Jones's rhythm and
here we have kind of what looks like a relatively normal P wave QRS complex in T wave. And then there's something funky happens. We have another complex and now all of a sudden we have this very rapid rate. Um, it's maybe 175, 100, 200, um, and um, there's a run. So one, two, three, four, five, six beats. And this is, do you know what this is? This is ventricular tachycardia. So why? Why are we suddenly seeing ventricular tachycardia? Well, we have cells dying, we have abnormal electrical activity, and suddenly we have these uncontrolled episodes of ventricular depolarization that, that are uh, ventricular tachycardia. It is a risk of cardiac ischemia and it's a risk of myocardial infarction and it is a common cause of death as a result of myocardial infarction. So we stabilize Mr. Jones. We give him 325 milligrams of aspirin to chew, ick, but we usually use baby aspirin so it doesn't taste so bad. And we give him IV morphine and we give him nitroglycerin and his pain gets better. So my first question is why do we give aspirin in this situation when we suspect and in this case have a clear diagnosis of myocardial infarction? Well, aspirin, among many other things, as a prostaglandin inhibitor, um, keeps platelets from aggregating. So it ideally will keep the clot from getting bigger. And as the body starts to mobilize clot dissolving mechanisms, um, the aspirin is important. It's not exactly a blood thinner, it's a um, platelet aggregation inhibitor, but it's going to keep that clot from getting bigger and help to stabilize it. And why maybe is he hurting less? There are a couple things. One is morphine, which is a pain medicine, and it um, interacts with um, receptors for endogenous enkephalins and blocks the transmission of pain signals. It also tends to relieve anxiety a little bit, which may decrease heart rate a little bit, may um, kind of dampen down sympathetic um, outflow, and maybe that will reduce myocardial oxygen demand. And he's gotten nitroglycerin, so we have dilated a bunch of things. We've dilated coronary arteries, so maybe we're getting a little bit more blood flow through um, the arteries um, that supply the muscle at risk. Maybe we are um, improving um, something called collateral flow, but probably primarily we're dilating the systemic system dropping blood pressure, decreasing afterload, and decreasing local myocardial oxygen demand. So Mr. Jones gets sent to the cardiac catheterization lab, the cath lab, and a catheter is introduced into his femoral artery and run to the ostium of the left main artery and here's the left main and some dye is injected and we can see that that dye flows freely through the left main and what's called the circumflex artery but there is a big blockage there's something virtually completely blocking the left anterior descending artery so where, why do you see dye past that blockage? You know, maybe a little bit of it's getting by. Maybe you can see a little hair there. 
but also maybe we've grown some collateral circulation um, from the circumflex over to the LAD beyond the blockage because that blockage has probably been growing relatively slowly. And what parts of the heart muscle are compromised? Well, if you remember, I said the left anterior descending artery supplies a lot. It supplies the papillary muscles, the septum, and much of the left ventricular wall. So that is important. That's a bunch of um, heart muscle at risk that allows us to pump. The left ventric ventricle is the main pump to the systemic circulation. So in the cath lab, a stent is delivered by the same catheter that was um, put here to inject dye. So a stent is a little bit of mesh that is inflated, that is expanded with a balloon, so some saline is injected, that causes this little bit of mesh to expand, pushing against the endothelium that has been ruptured um, and suddenly it's open again and it has restored blood flow to the LV wall and Mr. Jones feels better. So he's kept in the hospital for a couple days. But while he, before he's discharged, his chest pain recurs. Suddenly he is complaining of that same crushing pain. We do a 12 lead. We see a very similar pattern with those tombstones. And before we can get him to the cath lab, he gets very, very short of breath. And you are a great PA. You happen to be on the spot. You pull out your stethoscope and, and you listen to his heart and lungs. And when you listen to his heart, you hear a murmur, a murmur that suggests turbulent blood flow. And the murmur that you hear is occurring in systole during left ventricular contraction. It is holosystolic, which means it starts at the beginning of systole and ends at the end of systole, meaning it starts when the mitral valve closes and ends when the aortic valve closes. And you know that that murmur is the murmur of mitral regurgitation because you've learned that in H&P with Dr. Perry. In addition, on lung exam, you hear crackles that weren't there this morning when you did rounds. And those crackles suggest he has a lot of fluid in his lungs. He has diffuse pulmonary edema. And we start nitroglycerin again, and he starts improving, and the murmur goes away, and his lungs clear. So I want you to think about what might have happened. You don't really know enough necessarily to get this, but this, and this isn't common, but it is a complication potentially of left anterior descending artery um, blockage. So you remember, because I mentioned it, that the mitral valve is anchored to the septum and the left ventricular wall by something called papillary muscles and chordae tendini. When there is ischemia or even um, cell death, infarction, you can have dysfunction of the papillary muscles such, as, such that they're displaced and the mitral valve is unable to completely close. And when that happens, you can have mitral regurgitation. And it can be transient if you restore appropriate blood flow to this muscle. Um, the papillary muscle will not be displaced. The cord eye tension will go back to normal. The mitral valve will be able to close and the mitral regurgitation. This is this oval is showing blood flow um, back from the 
left ventricle into the left atrium. Normally during systole, blood is only flowing out of the aortic valve. But with mitral regurgitation, um, as the left ventricle contracts, blood is flowing backwards through the mitral valve back into the left atrium. So we have started the nitro, um, nitroglycerin drip, we've decreased afterload, we've dilated some things, and we've restored some blood flow to the left ventricle and the left septum and the papillary muscle. And when that happens, um, the mitral valve goes back to normal. But there's something bad going on. So um, rather, and what's what's happened here is that that stent has has failed, and it's probably failed because there's still um, active disruption of the endothelium, and another clot has formed. Even though we've probably put Mr. Jones on some blood thinners, so he's sent directly to the operating room, having been referred to cardiothoracic surgery. They do what's called a coronary artery bypass graft, which is um, a procedure in which um, veins, usually from the leg, are uh, are taken and sewn um, in such a way as to bypass the blockage and allow blood flow from the left main to the um, distal left anterior descending artery. But through these events, he's lost some heart muscle. And when you, before you discharge him, say a week later, he has an echocardiogram. He has images done using sound waves. And on the echocardiogram, his ejection fraction, or the percentage of blood being ejected by his left ventricle during each systole, is down to about 30%. And, and that's not good. It's not terrible. Um, but normal would be, say, 70%. So he has a poor ejection fraction. And we've talked to him a lot about lifestyle and counseled him and gotten him to quit smoking. And he's discharged and, and he's going to take his medicines and eat better and exercise. And a couple weeks later, it's Thanksgiving, and he has a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner with his family. But that night, he starts to feel a little short of breath, and his ankles and feet and lower legs are swelling. So he goes to bed, and he wakes up extremely short of breath, dysnic. And he's coughing up pink, foamy phlegm. And his wife calls uh, 911, and he's back to the hospital by ambulance. So what do you think happened here? What do you think may have happened? I think he's experiencing an episode of congestive heart failure. And that's because his pump doesn't work great. His ejection fraction is only 30%. And something happened today to increase demand on the pump that it couldn't keep up with. What happened is that he ate Thanksgiving dinner and nobody thought to be careful about the amount of salt in, in all of the sides. And he ate a little bit of everything and he enjoyed it, which is normal on Thanksgiving, but he had a huge sodium load. And that sodium load because more salt in, more water in, meant that his volume is up. And the heart, uh, with the um, uh, poor ejection fraction, isn't able to keep up with the increase in preload. And suddenly, it's failing as a pump. He's short of breath because the pressures, since the heart is failing as a pump and it's not able to push enough out forward, pressures in the pulmonary system get higher. And it's kind of backflow from the left ventricle to the left atrium to the pulmonary veins to the pulmonary capillaries. And he gets edema in his lungs, so he's short of breath. Why are his ankles swollen? 
Well, the shortness of breath is from failure of the left-sided pump. But those high pressures get further transmitted back to the right side, which is also not keeping up, and into the venous system. And we have just more pressure, more hydrostatic pressure um, on his feet and legs. So that when he's standing, there's a lot more blood on the venous side, higher pressures in the capillaries of his feet and legs. And he got edema. And when he went to bed, and he took some of the hydrostatic pressure of gravity off of his legs, some of that edema was able to, tr to come back in to the vasculature and even further increase the pressures on the venous side. So suddenly he's got much worse pressure, he, he's got much worse pulmonary edema. So this is not unusual for somebody with left heart failure to get secondary right heart failure. They have pulmonary edema and they have peripheral edema. And when you have peripheral edema and you lie down, you remove gravity as a factor, there's more um, intravascular volume uh, resulting in higher pressures in the pulmonary system and, and pulmonary edema. The symptom of um, developing um, dyspnea or shortness of breath um, when you lie down at night is called um, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Um, and, and is not unusual in people with poor ejection fractions and left-sided heart failure. And um, just getting short of breath lying down is orthopnea. Um, waking up suddenly short of breath um, is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And here's his chest x-ray. And so um, this is a normal chest x-ray, and this isn't his chest x-ray. This is a normal chest x-ray. It shows a uh, fairly normal-sized heart in the uh, thoracic cavity with lungs that have normal markings. The, the, the dark areas that you see are air. These white streaks are vessels. Um, you know, these are obviously ribs, but this is a relatively normal chest x-ray. And this is an abnormal chest x-ray in which several things are, are, are quite different. One of those things is that the diameter of the heart uh, shadow itself is wide and it actually exceeds half of the um, thoracic cavity diameter. This is clearly less than half of the thoracic cavity diameter. This is clearly more than half of that. So the heart's enlarged and especially the left ventricle here. And in addition because of high pressures in the pulmonary system um, we have edema. We have leaking of fluid into the alveoli and we get white where there should be dark. Um, and it's in what, what I would call a bat wing pattern. So this is an x-ray of pulmonary edema from congestive heart failure. Now, while he's still in the emergency room, we do things like obviously a 12 lead. Um, and the 12 lead doesn't show any additional evidence of damage. We don't see new myocardial infarction. We also draw blood for biomarkers, which we did at his first visit, but I didn't mention. Um, and the main biomarker that's used these days is called troponin. And if you remember when we talked about the um, cardiac myocyte, troponin is a component of the actin and myosin um, system that allows for contraction. And so when 
cardiac myocytes die, troponin is released into the circulation and it gives us a indicator that heart muscle is dying and, and, and we find that heart muscle isn't dying. So he's just got failure, so we treat the failure. We give him a nitroglycerin drip to reduce oxygen demand to the myocardium. We, we give him furosemide or Lasix, which is a potent diuretic. The reason for that is to help his kidneys get rid of some of that excess salt and water. We also give him two drugs. One of them is Carvedilol, which is a adrenergic um, antagonist and it is an alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 blocker that has been shown for which there is evidence that it decreases mortality and morbidity in people with um, congestive heart failure. And we also give him enalapril, which is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, an ACE inhibitor. And again, we have good evidence that ACE inhibitors um, improve morbidity and mortality in people with uh, heart failure. And when we give those drugs, his breathing gets better. He, he gets less short of breath his chest x-ray clears and in a day or two, a couple days, he's discharged on enalapril, the ACE inhibitor, carvedilol, the alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 blocker, and Lasix along with diabetes medicines and cholesterol medicines, um, making sure that his uh, hypertension is controlled. These drugs are both antihypertensives, but in the case of somebody like Mr. Jones, it's possible that he needs additional drugs. So what dietary advice would you give Mr. Jones? And this is really important. Hopefully somebody talked to him before he was ever discharged the first time and he just forgot. But Mr. Jones needs to be extremely cautious about his sodium intake. Um, it's not drinking excess water so much that increases volume. It's the combination of water and salt. If you have uh, excess salt, sodium in your diet, um, volume increases and you're much more likely to have edema, pulmonary edema, and symptoms of congestive heart failure. So if you have questions about that case, please email them to me and I'll put together a document to try to answer them for everybody. Our next case is Joe. Joe Jessup, he's a 33 year old soldier with a history of hypertension. You're his primary care provider and because it has taken three antihypertensives at fairly high doses to get his blood pressure under control, you decide that we need to search for possible causes of what we call secondary hypertension. Most hypertension is essential hypertension, also called primary hypertension. It's its own disease. We don't have something else causing it. But there are a couple of things that can cause hypertension. Um, that are potentially reversible. So the first step in looking for those causes is that you do a really good history and physical exam. And on physical exam, you notice a bruit, a murmur, an abnormal sound um, that appears to be systolic and it's in his belly. So when you're listening to his abdomen, you hear and so you wonder if there's something going on with his renal artery or his aorta and you do an ultrasound again imaging using sound waves and when you do that ultrasound um, you discover that he has something called renal artery stenosis that he has a narrowing of the right renal artery. And that narrowing of the right renal artery, um, this is 
impossible to interpret this as an ultrasound. Um, I find ultrasounds difficult. Hopefully as you go along in your medical education you'll you'll learn enough about ultrasound to be able to interpret some images. But it it's using um, sound waves to, to detect abnormal blood flow. Um, and he ends up getting an arteriography, so dye is injected and pictures are taken. And um, this image is showing probably the left uh, renal artery, but he has a high grade stenosis in the right renal artery. So there is blood flow after the stenosis, um, but it is, a, it is a significant narrowing of the artery. So why is there a brewery? Why do you hear that? <sighs> you remember what causes those abnormal sounds, murmurs, um, and brewies is turbulent blood flow. So the stenosis in the right renal artery means that the blood um, that is being ejected through that irregular artery that irregular stenosis is causing turbulence and resulting in vibrations that result in a brewery. The next question requires some thinking. And it's why do you think that this, this obstruction, and it's not a complete obstruction, there is no collateral blood flow here because there's only a single renal artery entering each kidney. There are two, but in each kidney there's one. Why would occluding it cause hypertension? Okay, so go back to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. When the cells in, near the glomerulus detect a decrease in what they consider volume because of decreased pressure, it activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So the juxtaglomerular cells release this hormone called renin, which interacts with angiotensinogen, which is a protein made in the liver circulating, converting the angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, which is further acted upon by an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme primarily in the lungs in the endothelium of the lung capillaries but also in the kidney um, and the angiotensin 2 has a couple of effects one is that it is a potent vasoconstrictor which increases blood pressure two is that it signals the adrenal gland, um, the cortex of the adrenal gland to make a um, hormone that is um, called aldosterone that tells the kidneys to hold on to salt and hold on to water and it signals the hypothalamus to make in the pituitary to release a hormone called antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. And antidiuretic hormone is also a potent vasoconstrictor um, like ans ans yeah, angiotensin II, but it is also, it acts on the um, cells in the lining of the renal tubules to prevent water um, from being um, lost into the urine. So it, it allows for more water aquaporins uh, to be made that, that bring water out of the urine and back in to the blood to hold on to more water. Now that might not be effective, right? Because the uh, really it's not that blood pressure is low. 
but that kidney is perceiving blood pressure to be low, so it thinks we need to hold on to salt and water. Um, An antidiuretic hormone makes us hold on to water. Um, uh, aldosterone makes us hold on to water and salt, again, to increase volume, while angiotensin II and ADH are causing um, blood vessels to constrict, and all of that is raising blood pressure. So how do you think we can treat this hypertension? We could keep giving them all kinds of drugs, but maybe if we do a surgery to bypass the stenosis, or we put a stent in to open the artery to improve blood flow, maybe this hypertension will just go away. And in fact, this is one of the few cases where hypertension is actually curable. Let's move on to our next, next case. This is another cardiovascular case. So we have Denise Huff, a 24-year-old woman who's been complaining of episodes of palpitations and rapid heartbeat, and she gets a little short of breath with the episodes. Um, she was at work when it happened, and her boss called EMS uh, at a point where she's holding her chest and complaining that her heart's racing. And in the ER, her pulse is about 150, and her blood pressure is 90 over 52, which is on the low side. So there are a whole lot of things that can cause rapid heart rate, tachycardia. Um, you, we, we talked about um, how autonomic um, sympathetic discharge, so the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, can speed up the heart rate at the sinus node. It doesn't usually get as fast as 150. Um, that might get you up to 115 or 120. We saw earlier the um, ventricular fibril, uh, sorry, ventricular tachycardia that can occur with ischemia. That rate could be 150 or higher, but it would be unusual in a 24-year-old. There are atrial tachycardias, and there are some things called reentry tachycardias. So we have to figure out what's going on with Miss Huff and why she's tachycardic. Why do you think her blood pressure is low? Not low, low, just low. Um, certainly it could be worse than that. Well, think about the fact that cardiac output is the um, product of heart rate and stroke volume. And when the heart rate is fast, is very fast, the ventricle isn't able to fill completely, so stroke volume goes down. And it's not unusual with rapid tachycardias for blood pressure to fall and be low. So this is the first um, 12 lead that we get. And it has some resemblance to ventricular tachycardia, but it's a little bit different. The curves are a little bit different. It's not that sort of wide um, complex. The complexes are still kind of narrow, so it really does not look like ventricular tachycardia. It is not a completely regular rhythm. It kind of speeds up and slows down a little bit. And when we cardiovert her and get her back into a normal rhythm, and we'll talk about how we do that, then this is her 12 lead. And we see something on her 12 lead, which is that instead of having a flat PR segment, so we have the P wave, we should then have a little isoelectric period that's the PR, and then the QRS complex. But instead, we have this sort of upslope into the QRS complex. And that is called a delta wave. And a delta wave is 
a finding seen in a condition called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So here we have the P wave. We should have this flat isoelectric PR interval, but instead we have this sort of upslope into the uh, QRS complex. So that's a this is a normal um, P and QRS and T. This is what we see with a delta wave, like that. And Wolf Parkinson White syndrome falls into the category of tachycardias that we call reentry tachycardia or sometimes pre excitation. So let us review the normal electrical pathways. Remember that the SA node has that characteristic called automaticity and it generates periodic rhythmic. Um, depolarizations that result in depolarization and contraction of the atria. That normally there is conduction from the atria to the ventricles only at one place, which is the AV node, the His bundle, and then the bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers. So the, the, the charge gets picked up at the AV node and then transmitted to the ventricles. People with reentry tachycardias have something called accessory pathways. And what happens is that when the um, impulse is transmitted to the ventricles, it manages to go back into the atria. So we have abnormal pathways, so we have somewhat abnormal directions and amplitudes of the flow of current. When you see somebody with this kind of re-entry tachycardia in the emergency room, the first thing you want to do is slow down their rhythm and get it back um, into a sinus rhythm. That can be done with vagal maneuvers so you can ask the person to bear down as if they're having a bowel movement to stimulate a little bit of vagal um, parasympathetic influence on the SA node, you can give a drug called adenosine, which is an antiarrhythmic, which will acutely slow the rhythm and bring the person back into a normal rhythm. But we want to keep this from happening in the future. It's uncomfortable, it's, and Ms. Huff doesn't want to continue to have episodes like this. So she needs to be put on medication that um, will slow conduction. And these are drugs we that fall into a category called antiarrhythmics. In the old days, digoxin was commonly used to slow conduction. Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker that slows conduction. But both of those can have um, bad consequences in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So typically we use an antiarrhythmic called flecamide or beta blockade. So a beta blocker drug to slow conduction. But the, the problem needs to be fixed. And the way that this problem is fixed is that specialized cardiologists in electrophysiology take the patient essentially to the cath lab and they have a catheter that can you they that helps them identify the location of the accessory pathway and then they use radio frequency um, to ablate the pathway to, to kind of kill the uh, cardiac myocytes that are creating the accessory pathway and most of the time that is a permanent or semi-permanent uh, cure and the patient will stop having anti or stop having arrhythmias. Here we have another case of a patient um, with edema. So let's this reminds me a lot. I think I wrote it with a patient in mind who um, I had a lovely lady who was in her 60s, a lifelong smoker, 
and a pretty heavy drinker through much of her life. She had a history of DVTs, um, deep vein thrombophlebitis. She had a history of um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as a result of smoking. And she comes in complaining of pitting edema in both of her legs all the way up to her knees. And she denies chest pain. She denies any uh, shortness of breath beyond her usual shortness of breath. And she's still smoking. And even though you've prescribed home oxygen, she says it's annoying and she doesn't like to wear the nasal cannula. When you ask about alcohol, she says she drinks a beer now and, that, and again, but you suspect both because of talking to her daughter and because of lab tests that indicated ongoing liver damage that uh, she's probably drinking more than a beer now and then. Her vitals show a respiratory rate of 20, which is a little high, and she's tripoding. She sits forward on her chair to help her expand her chest and breathe. And her pulse oximeter, her partial pressure of oxygen, is 82%, which is quite low. Normal is 93 or above. Um, this is a lady who's all, always runs low, and she doesn't particularly feel uncomfortable um, when she is running in the low 80s. So let's think about some things that might be contributing to her peripheral edema based on what we learned in one of those earlier lectures. I would say that Let's go back to the beginning. She has a history of deep vein thrombophlebitis, meaning that she has incompetent venous valves and she gets higher pressures on the venous side because she's not able to return blood from her lower extremities effectively. This happens after deep vein um, blood clots that interfere with the valves in the veins that keep blood from flowing backwards through the veins. In addition, she has a history of alcoholism and my bet is that she has cirrhosis and that her liver isn't as good at making things as it ought to be. One of the things that the liver makes is albumin which is the primary a contributor to plasma oncotic pressure, a pressure that is created by the viscosity of plasma from um, dissolved proteins like albumin and that holds fluid in the vessels and keeps it from leaking out. Remember that there's lots of protein in the intravascular fluid and very little in the um, extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid. Um, in addition, people with chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic lung disease, can develop right-sided um, heart failure from uh, high pressures in the pulmonary vasculature that back up to the right heart. And that's not an uncommon complication of chronic lung disease. And again, high pressures in the right heart and poor pumping of the right ventricle can lead to higher pressures in the capillary bed on the venous side and result in edema. That would be right-sided heart failure. So based on all of that, what are some things that you think we should do as labs? You know, I'd certainly want um, to look at her liver function, including her plasma proteins. I'll tell you that somebody with cirrhosis who isn't making adequate 
albumin may also not be making adequate clotting proteins. And so we would probably want to look at her clotting proteins, at her albumin and her total protein, at her liver enzymes, um, all of that, at her, at her blood count. Um, and that's just because um, I'd want perhaps a blood gas to look at her um, CO2 level as well as her oxygen level and her pH. Um, imaging wise, we might want to do an ultrasound to see if she has additional new blood clots in her legs that might be contributing to the edema. But the main thing, I, I certainly want a chest x-ray. And on that chest x-ray, I'm going to be looking for evidence of right heart enlargement. And I'm going to want an EKG. So let's see what, what we got. Well, here's our EKG. And the EKG shows that this lady has right atrial enlargement and right ventricular enlargement. I will tell you that as I, I said in the lecture where we talked about EKGs that one of the things an EKG can show you is um, chamber size and that's particularly true with ventricular enlargement using assorted criteria. So just I gave you in that lecture the criteria for left ventricular enlargement here we are looking at the criteria for right ventricular enlargement. It's right access deviation, um, a dominant R wave in V1. This is very unusual. If you remember, usually you get negative impulses initially um, on the uh, chest leads to the septal side. Um, and a dominant S wave here in V5 or 6. Um, the QRAS duration is still narrow, which means that these other changes aren't from something called a right bundle branch block. We can see that this P wave is a little high and kind of peaked, and that is um, a sign of p potentially right atrial enlargement. And then there are some changes in the ST segment in the um, T in the S, sorry, the T wave um, that are indications of what's called a strain pattern. So you don't have to understand any of that. You don't have to recognize these patterns. But I'm using this as an illustration of how the EKG shows us lots of things beyond rate and rhythm and even ischemia. Looking at this lady's chest x-ray, we do see um, that the heart is enlarged. It seems to be um, bulging out more to the right, and this is the right atrium actually. Um, the pulmonary artery is maybe a little dilated. When we do an ultrasound, we see marked thickening of the right ventricular wall, very large right atrium. So this is a lady who has pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension has, um, is associated with a lot of morbidity and mortality. The single most important treatment for pulmonary hypertension is oxygen supplementation. So the, this um, patient needs to understand that, that the oxygen isn't just to make her feel better, but it's to help her heart and to help her live longer. Um, and sometimes education will help people who are not complying comply better. The single most important thing to keep her from getting worse is to get her to quit smoking. I did eventually get my patient to quit smoking, but unfortunately 
by the time she quit smoking and she and she got much more compliant with her um, oxygen but she developed um, um, hepatic carcinoma liver cancer as a result of her cirrhosis and subsequently ended up dying of her liver cancer rather than of her lung disease. She lived remarkably well and comfortably with her lung disease and right heart failure for way longer than I would have expected. This is our next case, case five. So we have a 60 year old man who's complaining of increasing shortness of breath. He's never smoked. He hasn't seen a doctor for years and years. When you question him about past history, um, he remembers that when he was a child, he had a heart murmur and had had rheumatic fever. So we look at his vital signs and his heart rate's 100. His blood pressure is 172 over 50 and his pulse oximetry is 90%. So this is upper limit of normal. This is a high systolic and a lowish diastolic and that's a little lower than normal, 93 being normal. So you do a good exam including a heart exam and a lung exam and you hear a murmur. The murmur is early in diastole, so lub-dub murmur, lub-dub murmur, and it gets quieter. It starts loud and is decrescendo. You hear it at the aortic area, which is just to the right of the sternum at the second, uh, second right intercostal space, and you also hear it at the point of maximal impulse, which is the place where we usually hear mitral valve murmurs. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you hear it, sorry, you hear the murmur, ah, let me go back. You do a careful exam, including a heart and lung exam, and you hear a murmur. This murmur, because you've been practicing listening and have listened to a lot of hearts, you can tell that the murmur occurs in diastole. So lub-dub murmur, lub-dub murmur. And in fact, it gets quieter. So lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. Although it's a little faster than that because his heart rate's 100. And you hear it at the aortic area, which is the right second intercostal space. Beyond that, when you palpate his chest, you can tell that his left, that his heart is enlarged, particularly his left ventricle, because the point of maximal impulse, which is normally felt at about the fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line, is displaced out to the left, um, which is an indication, sorry, of a uh, enlarged left ventricle. When you listen to his lungs, he has crackles and it's in both sides, it's about halfway up. And that suggests pulmonary edema. He has two plus peripheral edema and he has an interesting nail finding. And I will do my best to put that video next. one and then S2 with this decrescendo murmur. Um, as this problem gets worse, the murmur actually tends to get shorter, not necessarily quieter, but shorter in duration. Um, this chest x-ray is showing a somewhat enlarged left ventricle. So let's think about what's causing the murmur. Um, this murmur is caused by blood flowing back th from the aorta into the ventricle during diastole. And that is turbulent backflow. 
So the turbulence causes the vibration that you hear as the murmur. So the difference between his systolic and diastolic pressures The next question is about the pulse pressure. So the pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic um, blood pressures. And 172 over 50 is an unusually wide pulse pressure. I mean, if, if you would expect 120 over 70 to be a normal blood pressure, uh, there's 50 points between 120 over 70 but there are 92 points between 172 and 50. Um, more than 92, I'm sorry. 72 plus uh, 50 is 130. It's a huge pulse pressure. Um, so the pulse pressure is wide because first, the left ventricle is having to pump extra hard to get an appropriate systolic pressure. So systolic pressure is high. But when the aortic valve tries to close during diastole, the aortic pressure can't be maintained because there's blood flowing back into the left ventricle. And so this creates this thing called a wide pulse pressure. Um, the left ventricle is enlarged because in order to pump an, an enough blood to supply the needs of the uh, systemic system, it has to first thicken. Uh, ultimately, it dilates. Um, and so the left ventricle becomes enlarged. When high pressures back up, as they do in conditions like aortic regurgitation, you get high pressure in the ventricle, you get high pressure back in the atrium, you get higher pressure um, in the pulmonary vasculature and capillary bed, and you can get pulmonary edema, which is fluid in the alveoli. And again, even though this is a problem that we would call left heart failure, where the left ventricle is undergoing um, a condition that results in an ineffective left pump, ultimately those pressures can back up to the right side of the heart and into the back to the venous side, uh, causing peripheral edema.